it is every man's obligation to put back into the world at least the equivalent of what he takes out of it. This is what is believed by Padma Shri Awardee, Karnatak Rajotsav Awardee, the best CFO in India, an angel investor, Sri T. V. Mohandas Pai, who is presently the chairman of Manipal Global Education. And true to his belief, he not only invests in startups, but along with his son, helps them in troubleshooting and gives them strategic inputs. After working with Infosys for 17 years, where Mr. Pai was known as the voice of Infosys in many capacities, he quit the company and started doing what he believed in. He has established think tanks that help citizens in taking informed decisions on political, social and legal issues. One of his most notable contributions in the area of education is Akshay Patra Foundation, which he founded along with others in ISKCON, Bangalore, which provides midday meal to over one and a half million children daily in 8,500 plus schools across nine states. This has brought down the dropout rates by 10%. Today, the Midday Meal program stands out as an exemplary public-private partnership, a testament to the new goals Mr. Pai has set himself. Babuso Kamath Memorial Lecture on Disruption in Traditional Business by Mohandas Pai. Members of the Gomantek Vidya Niketan, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Goa is our home place, is the place where our gods are. We all, as companies, have allegiance to Goa. Our Kula Devadas are here, and coming back here is always a special occasion. And I want to commend the organizers for organizing the lecture for the last 18 years because in a democracy an enlightened citizenry is essential to make democracy works and those who believe in democracy need to propagate that power belongs to all of us and we as independent sovereign citizens give power to political leaders to rule over us under the rule of law and they're accountable to us and to make them accountable we have to be knowledgeable and having such leadership programs indeed spreads knowledge in every city, town and village in this country. I've chosen a particular topic to speak today because of what we see around the world. To understand how societies are getting disrupted, we have to go back a little bit into history. From the dawn of civilization till about 1820-1825, countries with large populations dominated the globe economically. India China had large populations and they were the largest economies in the world, even though there were other countries, but India and China dominated. From the start of the Christian era till about 1000 ADE, India was the largest economy, then China became the largest economy for the next 500 years, and then India took over till around 1820. In 1820, India and China made up 45% of world GDP. And around that time, a very unique event happened, which disrupted the world as was known at that point of time and changed the global economy. And that was the invention of the steam engine. Why were these economies rich and large? They were rich and large because economies were built civilizations were built on human muscle and animal power. There was no motive power, so we needed people. And people used their muscle and their strength to create handicrafts, textiles, trade, commerce, build great temples, institutions, and generally prosperity came because of trade, because of surpluses to handicrafts, and things done by human beings are people using animal power. So large populations always meant that you could have wealth, provided you are not dominated or destroyed by invaders 
who took away your wealth. And that was the status quo for a very long period of time. And the wealth was in land. Those who owned the land were the lords, and those who tilled the soil were the serfs. It was an established feudal order that was there all around the world. And that was the way the world was governed for thousands of years from the dawn of history till the point of time. And around that time in 1820, 1830, the steam engine invented a few years before that went off patent and that started the age of machines. And the age of machines changed the world forever in many, many ways. In 1500, of course, Vasco da Gama came to Kochi, I think first, then to Goa, and he opened up the trade route and that led to a minor disruption because till then, power was in the hands of landlords, people who owned the land, and the kings. Power slowly shifted to merchants who did trade. There's already the silk route from China, India to Europe. The Arabs used to trade with India, take the spices and send it to Europe. They were the intermediaries between the East and the West. Then of course you had Marco Polo and others who took the arduous journey to China and to show how wealth was in those days. We heard about Alexander's conquest, we heard about the Persian Empire, we heard about Chandragupta Maurya's Empire and all that, but that's a very slow world and the world did not change fast in a very dramatic manner at that point of time. But after 1500, slowly the merchants also started accumulating wealth because of trade. But that's a very slow process. Now the accumulation of wealth in the hands of the merchants and the start of the machine era meant that wealth accumulated in Europe, factories were built, people came off the land because their health conditions improved and started going to cities and people came on the land, were put into factories, women <coughs> children provided cheap labor and these factories produced goods which were cheaper than done by hand, it produced goods of consistent quality and produced goods in large numbers and the traders went to the warm countries to get raw material to feed the factories. Cotton was the raw material for textiles and then you had the spices and you had other kinds of raw materials which are going, iron ore and, and the rest. So when factories were built, wealth accumulated, cities grew and Europe grew. In 30 years, 40 years, Europe became the largest economy in the world. And the growth of Europe from 1820 onwards till about 1900 was extremely well done and extremely fast because there's an accumulation of capital, there's exploitation of the colonies, there was great trade, there was greater consumption, incomes of people went up, factories came and provided employment, urbanization took place, and then you saw a very new world, all in about 80 years. For thousands of years, you had a particular way of doing, of running the world, and 18 years, you saw the rise of an industrial society, you saw the rise of the industrial revolution. And this had a profound repercussions. We saw the decline of Asia. China was engrossed in its own internal battles. India, the large economy, was occupied. This colonial exploitation of Africa, America was coming up <coughs> because it got the capital from the Europeans because that's a new vast land where people emigrated from the overcrowded countries of Europe because of the population explosion and generally the world belonged to Europe and the world belonged to the white man. Everybody else was in a downward spiral. Then took an event in 1914 which changed the world again. In Sarajevo, an anarchist shot Archduke Ferdinand was the heir apparent to the Austria-Hungarian Empire. And if you look at the world at that time politically, you see the Tsars ruling Russia, they've been around for 600 years. You saw the Austrian-Hungarian Empire ruling Austria-Hungary. They've been around for 600 years too. And you saw the Germans consolidating under Bismarck and unifying, creating William, creating, uh, creating a king for themselves. And then you had England, which had their own colonies, the French had a republic. They suffered under the Napoleonic Wars, were weakened, but nevertheless, they were a republic. America was uh, coming up. And in the Middle East, you had the Ottoman Empire. In the 13th century, the Turks had come and conquered the Eastern Roman Empire. Rome was broken up into the Western Empire and the Western Empire was destroyed by the Huns I think in the 6th century ADE and in the 14th, 13th and 14th century the Turks came and took over 
the Eastern Roman Empire, and they were the rulers of the Islamic world. The Ottoman Empire Sultan ruled Mecca and Medina, the holy place for the Muslims, and he was the keeper of the holy places, and he was the caliph. You now understand the importance of the caliph, because the Muslim world, the caliph was deemed to be the spiritual ruler for the entire Muslim world. And his empire was indeed very, very large. So this is a political construct. India was under <coughs> the British with many Indian kings. China was undergoing much internal rebellion at that point of time. In 1864, the European powers had devastated the summer palace in Beijing. And China was getting weaker. China was having trade with the West. The West was growing richer. And Japan was closed and started growing under the Meiji Restoration. Kind of the construct. The world ruled by empires, the world ruled by nobles, the world ruled by nobility, and the world which was totally undemocratic. And because of the rise of an industrial society, Karl Marx and Engels have come with the social theories to say that capital accumulated because of surplus labor. Labor is the originator of capital, and the capital has to be shared with labor, but the exploitative capitalistic class would not share the surpluses and therefore the workers had to unite, the workers had to fight, and the workers had to drive out the capitalists to create an egalitarian society. So socialism and communism came as a response to the exploitation in the industrial world. So in, 14, in, um, in 1914, uh, in Serbia, when Archduke Ferdinand was going to the city in, in Sarajevo, it appears that his car took a wrong route because the driver was new. And they were this anarchist, and he was shot, and he was killed. Austria-Hungary declared war on uh, on that particular country, and then uh, Germany, uh, under Kaiser William, joined, and they started attacking, uh, you know, attacking in, in the Eastern Balkans. At the same point of time, when they did that, uh, France was on the side of those countries. Uh, France declared war, England declared war, and suddenly there's a world war. World War was Europe at war, not India at war, not China at war. 25% of the first population was war, and that's a world war. The world war started with cavalry and infantry. It led to the killing fields of Flanders in Belgium, where young people went into trenches, were there for about 12, 13 months, sitting and dying in the cold uh, with a lot of uh, uh, depravities for them. and then. The war ended in 1918 with the defeat of Germany because Russia entered the war, uh, because Germany attacked Russia, America entered the war in 1917. So when the war ended, uh, the Russian Empire was gone because 1917 there was internal rebellion, a civil war, the Bolsheviks took over, the Communist Party took over, and the Tsar was overthrown and killed. For the first time, there's a rebellion by the working class led by the Communists. And, Stal and, uh, and Lenin and Stalin came to power. <coughs> Germany was defeated and Kaiser William had to abdicate. Uh, France was, you know, neither here nor there. And England had got weakened because four years it had to spend its resources. One million Indian troops fought on the side of the British in, uh, in uh, Asia and in France and in Germany at that point of time. The US had come into the war in 1917 uh, because they wanted peace in Europe and the US also became a great industrial power because they were protected by the Atlantic and they never suffered any damage and when the war ended uh, you had tanks on the ground you had planes in the air you had mustard gas and chemical warfare and you had mechanized uh, troops mechanized troops in the war the way the war fought was also different 16 million people were killed 16 million in four years and the world changed the political economy of the world changed. And in the Middle East, you have the Ottoman Empire, which went bust. The Ottoman Empire was the, called the sick man of Europe. Uh, Ottoman Empire fought the war on, on the part of the Axis powers, that is Germany, and they were defeated because they didn't have the wherewithal. And the Axis tried to break up the Ottoman Empire. And Kemal Ataturk, a major uh, who fought as a nationalist against the Greeks who came to Tokyo take over, declared a secular republic of Turkey, I think in 1921, and abolished the caliphate. Abolished the caliphate. The Sultan was deposed and he wanted to make Turkey into a modern republic, not an Islamic theocracy. So look at the world. The whole world changed. And in the East, 
the Japanese have become much more aggressive because they defeated Russia in Valdivostok. Uh, you know, China was going through its own internal fights because they were the uh, a Maoist, a rip of Maoist fight. I mean, I won't say Maoist fight, the Communist Party was coming into power and trying to do certain activities there. But China was in turmoil. It was a country which was weakened because Beijing was weak. And if you see the last movie, The Last Emperor, you understand the political impact of uh, what happened there. So 1921, the Treaty of Versailles was signed under which Germany is supposed to pay reparations. At the same time, in 1920, two diplomats, Sykes and Pico, sat down on a warm day and over tea, redrew the map of the Middle East. They created the countries of Iraq, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Lebanon. They created the countries of Syria and Jordan and Palestine. And in 1917, in the British Parliament, the Lord Balfour, the Secretary of State, declared that the Jews would have a homeland and said the homeland would be Israel uh, after the war. And the Jews came out and emigrated to Israel and said over a period of time that this is going to be a country because it was said in the Torah and in the Jewish Bible. So the, the world changed. And, and if you trace it back, it goes back to the age of machines. It was the machine that created this kind of a world. It was the machine that led to empires. It was the machine that led to the wars. The machine that led to destruction. And after the war, Germany went through a period of great difficulty because of reparations and the economy has weakened, politically unstable. Hitler came to power, I think, in 1932 uh, with, the, with the view to stabilizing the whole of Germany. He developed Germany tremendously till 1939. In the meantime, America went through the Wall Street crash of 1929. England went through uh, many economic troubles and Africa was in turmoil. India went through a freedom struggle and China was in turmoil. But when uh, Hitler started uh, flexing his muscles and taking back the land surrounded by Germany after the Treaty of Versailles, saying it is one-sided, he first went and took over part of Czechoslovakia, then he uh, went to and took over, tried to conquer Poland. When he tried to conquer Poland, uh, the English had a treaty with Poland and they declared war against Hitler and thus started the Second World War. And the Second World War was again due to the age of machines because Hitler had built the Autobahn, Hitler had built his tanks, Hitler had built his planes, he had a formidable army. It appears when the German army invaded uh, Poland, the Polish came and drove against his tanks with cavalry and horses. And Hitler had built a fantastic war machine and the back end were still horses for supply chains. In the front end were the tanks and the front end they had, uh, you know, armored, armored movement and they could go 50 kilometers a day, 50 kilometers a day in the Blitzkrieg with the Panzer divisions. So Hitler conquered the whole of Europe very shortly by, I think, 1941. He conquered the whole of Europe. The French had built a defense line between Germany and uh, France called the Maginot Line. He sides up the Maginot Line. England was driven back in Dunkirk. He allowed them to escape and England was isolated and there was a war at sea. At the same time, uh, Turkey was very, very quiet at that point of time because they did not want to take sides. In the East, in the East, there was a communist insurrection with Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Tse Tung, and there was a fight going on in China. China was in turmoil. India was going through her own fight for independence and Japan attacked the United States in Pearl Harbor because Japan in 1935, in order to get resources attacked China, they went to Manchuria, took over the country and tried to make China and Korea their <coughs> colonies because they wanted to expand. They're going through a population boom. So when the war ended in 1945, the world changed again. The world changed again. Germany was destroyed. The Soviet Union, which lost 20 million people because the Germans went against the Soviet Union, were defeated by the Soviet, by the Russian climate. Napoleon had taken his grand army of 1 million people against Russia and only 50,000 came back because the Russian winter was something they could not manage. Hitler too suffered uh, because he went just before the winter in Operation Barbarossa and that set led to a setback and Hitler was essentially destroyed by the Soviet advances from inside. So Germany was destroyed, France was devastated, France had been taken over, the whole of Europe was devastated, Germany was bombed. The United Kingdom, England had become very weak. America entered the war 
I think in 1942 after Pearl Harbor and America became the greatest economic power in the world at that point of time. In 1945 when the war ended, uh, Japan was destroyed with atomic bomb because Japanese had come into Asia and in Kohima on the eastern border of India, 15,500 Indian and British troops fought off 15,000 Japanese and drove them down from Kohima, down, down Burma into Malaya, whereas MacArthur came from the sea. And the Japanese had been destroyed, the economy was gone, and the world was a very different place and the start of the United Nations to make sure there was peace. And the war ended with V2 rockets, two and a half thousand rockets being shown from Hitler's Germany to hit, uh, to hit uh, London. There was a battle with jets just coming out in the air. There was armored cavalry, there was armored uh, uh, troops going around, sophisticated tanks, and the entire warfare was changed and 60 million people were dead. 60 million people. And trace it back, it was due to the age of the machine again. Look at the destruction, 16 million, 60 million, and the world was changed. And then for a decolonization, and the entire world today has about 200 countries. Africa was decolonized, India got a freedom, Southeast Asia got a freedom, Japan had a pacific, pacifist uh, uh, constitution, China went communist in 1949 uh, with Mao taking over and closed shop. The Soviet Union came and took east, the eastern part of uh, Europe and the Warsaw Pact started. Churchill made the famous remarks about the Iron Curtain having descended upon Europe. America had become the greatest country and gave aid to Europe and to uh, Japan to come back and there were two great powers, Soviet Union and there was America. So look at the world. So go back to 1820 and go back to 1945, 125 years. What is 125 years? Five generations. Thousand generations had made the world and five generations changed the world because of the age of machines. So after the war, we saw the rise of Japan, the rise of Germany, the rise of Asian tigers in Southeast Asia, now the rise of China, China has become the largest economy in the world. The United States is shrinking, Europe is shrinking, India is rising, Africa is uh, free, there are countries in Africa, South America is limping, and Japan is aging, and the world is very different. But in the last 10 years, another event has taken place, which is going to bring about a greater disruption in the next 15 years than what happened in the last 150 years. And that disruption, 170 years. And that disruption is arising because of the internet. A lot of you laugh and say, what is this disruption due to the internet? Let me explain. The internet has created a common platform where 7 million people around the world can interact with each other using small devices with rich data, synchronously or unsynchronously. It created a common platform. The industrial revolution created a global supply chain. The industrial revolution created markets. The developed in the West created financial markets, but they were all disconnected and people who controlled the supply chain made money. That means the distributors and the financiers made money, the producers and consumers paid the price. Now you have the internet as a common platform where anybody can trade with anybody, anybody gets information about anything which is available free of cost and the world has shrunk and you can talk to each other and do business asynchronously at a time of your choosing with the data being available all over the world. In the world today, there are six million mobile connections, six billion mobile connections, three and a half billion smartphones. There are more data being exchanged every year. Every year, more data is being created than the accumulated data available in the whole world since the rise of humanity. The accumulated knowledge of the whole world is available on the web almost for free. And people are connected and the world is becoming flat. People in any part of the world know much more about the world than others. Because throughout history, if you go back, the knowledge in a society was kept in the hands of a few. India had the oral traditions, so knowledge in the hands of a few. Then came the printing press, and then came writing, but they were in the form of books. And people who read the books knew everything. People who didn't read the books knew nothing. Now, you don't need to read. You can have a mobile device and import and ask Google a query, and you get an answer. You get the rich lectures, the best professors in the world. You get rich multimedia. Content is freely available. All knowledge is available. No knowledge is hidden anywhere to anybody, whereas knowledge is not available to the majority of people 
from the world. So the world has changed. And how is this going to impact industry? How is it going to impact society? How is it going to impact the way the world is? How is technology going to change? So I'm going to explain that to you just to show that this disruption is going to have much faster, quicker changes than ever before. And you're going to see the rise of a very new, different world because the age of machines, now machines with intelligence. The industrial revolution was the age of the machines. Now machines are developing intelligence. And how is it happening? I'll explain to you. We are in what you call Industry 4.0. Industry 1.0 was the industrial revolution. Industry 2.0 was the assembly line of Henry Ford. Industry 3.0, the rise of PLC machines and computer-aided machines. And Industry 4.0 is the rise of IoT, smart machines, and robotics running factories. So we're seeing dramatic change in production too. So let's look at the impact on industries. Let's take the oil industry. The world consumes 97 million barrels of oil every single day. Oil makes up 60% of the world's energy and 60% of the oil is consumed in the automobile industry. Till about four or five years ago, oil was at $145 a barrel. And because of the first oil shock in 1971, the United States stopped exporting oil. Till 1971, the United States was the largest exporter of oil and the largest producer of oil. The US has got huge reserves. But after the price shot up, they said it is a, is a declining asset, so we go to shut shop. And the US uh, had banned exports. And the Middle East had become the swing producer. They learned how to form cartels. And OPEC used to uh, you know, dictate the price of oil. And oil was very important. The world had $6 trillion of business in oil. The price of oil crashed from $145 a barrel to about $35. Now it's come to 69 barrels or so. And why did it happen? Because the American discovered fracking. What is fracking? When you drill for oil, you drill horizontally. But fracking means you come down horizontally and um, you come down vertically and go horizontally into small pools of oil and gas. Now, if you drill uh, vertically down, you get into big pools of oil and gas and you take it out. But there are small pools of oil and gas stuck in rock, which is very difficult to extract. They found a way of um, going horizontal drilling and tapping into the small pools and drawing it out in Texas and other places. So US production of oil has gone up from 2 million barrels about 10 years ago to about 9.75 million barrels. An increase in America's production and development in other places meant the price of oil has crashed. So there's a disruption happening in the oil industry at $2 trillion. From six trillion to four trillion, the value has come down. Two trillion dollars has become the consumer surplus. We used to pay oil prices to the producers. Oil prices have come down. Now the consumers used to pay got back two trillion dollars. And this has vast repercussions. Vast repercussions in a very big way. And the repercussions are the Middle East is in turmoil. You've seen change in Saudi Arabia, which is the largest exporter of oil in the world. Prince Salman has come. Young Prince is trying to bring up a change. Stop the Wahhabis. They stop terrorism. Because they have $750 million of reserves. Now, because the budget deficit went to 20% of GDP, their reserves have come down to $500 billion, and they only have possibly six to seven years of reserves before it runs down. So he's trying to restructure his country, and that has an impact on Iran, that has an impact on the Middle East, and the Middle East's ability to dictate oil prices down, and the money going there is coming down. And we've got to see how the political structure and social structure of the Middle East changes. And that disruption is taking place. The United States has become independent it is oil. It produces enough and is exporting. India is importing oil from the United States and the price is much lower. So the United States doesn't depend on the Middle East for oil. How does it handle the politics of the Middle East? It has no economic interest. Somebody can take it over, his economy will run fine. And this disruption is happening along with other disruption, which is going to have a greater impact on oil. You take the auto industry, one in six jobs from the world is in the auto industry. The world makes 90 million four-wheelers plus, 90 million every year. It's a $2 trillion industry, $2 trillion. Now, we are seeing the rise of the electric vehicle. An electric vehicle has 20 moving parts. Is it chassis with the electric motor and a piece of software like Tesla? It's got 20 moving parts. An IC engine has got 2,000 moving parts. In the rise of the IC engine, during the industrial revolution which created global mobility and allowed shipping to be automated, shipping to go with an engine, it had automobiles, it had everything else and brought the world together. Now suddenly the internal combustion engine is becoming less and less viable because the electric car is coming. 
and the electric car has got pretty moving parts. The electric car costs thousand five hundred dollars a year to maintain in America. An IC engine costs ten thousand five hundred dollars a year. So what's happening today? People are putting up a solar panel, converting the sun's energy into electricity, storing it in storage, plugging the car in, and they can run three hundred kilometers a day, no fuel. And the solar efficiency of solar energy is going up from eighteen percent to twenty-four percent. That means 24% energy that falls can be converted into electricity at a lower cost. And if that happens, people don't have to use diesel, people don't have to use petrol. And if you don't use diesel and petrol, 60% of which is oil consumption, what happens to the oil industry? Because the auto industry is the largest consumer of oil in the world. And the whole oil industry is built on pumping up from the ground, putting into pipelines, taking it to the port, putting it into ship, getting it to the refineries, refining it and distributing. The entire apparatus could come down. And I think today the world makes about one and a half million electric vehicles. And by 2020, they probably will make three million. China will make seven and a half million by 2025. By 2030, 60 to 70 percent of all vehicles will be electric vehicles. 60 to 70 percent. And an electric vehicle can reportedly go up to 500,000 kilometers without getting destroyed. Why? Because there are no moving parts, very less moving parts. And if you see in a Tesla, a Tesla is a fantastic piece of engineering done ground up. And you sit in the Tesla, you can't hear the motor. So they've got to put some noise to hear the motor. And it oscillates from zero to 60 uh, kilometers in about four seconds. And it's very silent. And the piece of software. Tesla downloads the software, the car downloads the software. And the software controls the entire vehicle, and the auto companies are coming with autonomous cars, cars that drive by, your, by by itself. So you can take a mobile and tell the car, car, please come here. The car will come from wherever it is and come to you. And say, take me to Ponda, I'll take you to Ponda. How is that? Because the radars in the car, and the car uses GSP, GPS to find out the location, take the radar, and can go in a, by itself and by self drive by itself. You can download data. And if you want to change the engine configuration, you can download the data. It'll go and park and it'll go away. And that means that the need for more cars will come down. And if cars become uh, electric, you're going to have other uh, repercussions too. One, the entire insurance industry will suffer. The entire repair industry will suffer. The distribution channels will suffer because you won't have many accidents. And if you don't have many accidents, all the repair shops will go down. And then we got what is called the sharing economy. 90% of the time a car is not used. 90% of the time, only 10% is a global average. Now when you want a car, young people don't want a car. They will order a car on Ola, Uber, car will come and take them wherever they want. So tomorrow they order on the app, the car will come, take them. Why do you want a car? Why do you want a garage? The cars will be floating around, owned by somebody, you come and pay to the mobile. And the number of cars in the world will come down, the number of parking lots will come down, the need for parking will go down. Is it happening? It's actually happening. By 2030, diesel cars will be banned in Europe. Germany says that Europe is working on it. By 2030, Beijing and everybody will have only electric cars. By 2030, India too says we're not going to have any IC engines. And the world changes to electric cars. And electric cars run on batteries. And the batteries in the electric car are lithium ion batteries. What is there in your PC or in your laptop? There's a battery kept in serial, a large number of batteries, and the battery works. And now the cost of the battery is coming down. A Tesla costs $35,000. They're going to have a car. Nissan is hoping to have a car for $10,000 in India in the next two years. Where the price of batteries is coming down. And if you have batteries only for 150 kilometers, the cars come down. And if you have an electric car, for seven lakhs or eight lakhs, everybody's uncle is going to buy the car. So look at the revolution that's happening. The oil industry is getting disrupted because of fracking, more oil is coming out. The auto industry consumer is getting disrupted because of the fact that cars are going to use less petrol, less diesel, and that means the entire global supply chain, shipping and everything else is going to change. And a bigger change is going to come in the utility industry. The world energy markets are changing. The world's energy markets, electricity is produced by burning coal. For the first time in 200 years in the UK, in the month of June, 100% of the power, 100% of power used by the UK was alternative power. Alternative power means power that came from gas, the power that came from windmills, and the power that came from solar. 19% energy of Germany is today alternative energy. 
and in Germany the largest company Aeon has been broken up into a distribution and transmission company an alter energy company and a coal manufacturing company and the price of the coal, man, coal uh, uh, generating company has come down and the price of them gone up in the financial markets in the whole of the United States the utility industry is the self of financial analyst so the utility industry is changing in India solar power is cheaper than grid power wind power has become cheaper than grid power wind power has been generated 2 rupees 50 paisa at the place of generation if you have transmission it comes to 3 rupees 50 paisa Solar is being done at 2 rupees 50 pesa. Soon you'll have solar panels in your house, you can get off the grid because the panel will get energy put into your storage in your house and all your requirements will be met by this. You don't have to go pay the LCT bill. What happened to all the plants? Today, the plants in India are only working up to 65%. And wind is also coming up in a very big way. India will have 1,75,000 megawatts of power in alternate energy by 2022. We have got about 45,000 megawatts right now. The world energy markets are changing in a very dramatic manner. So you have oil prices coming down, oil consumption going down, and you have the industry which was based on auto coming down because of electric engines, and then you have the utility industry which gave energy coming down. And these three industries make up maybe about 12 trillion dollars of global GDP. And when the energy consumption comes down, you get distributed grids. And distributed grids are already being seen all the world and pollution levels come down pollution levels are going to come down so look just imagine how the disruption is happening it's happening it's happening every single day and the chinese have got into electric vehicles china has got three lakh fifty thousand electric buses three lakh fifty thousand electric buses beijing air is becoming cleaner in India too, the government has got a program to get more electric buses. In two years time, we'll have electric buses in Goa. You should ban diesel buses and get only electric buses. In four years time, we'll have 6,000 electric buses in Bangalore. All the buses are going to be electric. The next industry that's going to get disrupted is manufacturing. How manufacturing? Just think, how does manufacturing take place? You mine an ore, you ship it to a plant. From the ore, you make metal, hot metal, you make it into pieces, then you cut the metal, right? Reductive manufacturing and make a part and the part you assemble and make a machine. Now there is 3D printing. What is 3D printing? You design a component on the PC and you press a button. Next to a 3D printing machine, they use plastic powder or metal powder to make a component or a car right in front of you, printing it out 30 microns at a time. So people have created a house using a 3D printing machine. People have created a rocket engine, people have created a racing car engine in Australia, people have created parts of your skull, part of your thigh bone for operations, people have created bed vessels, people have created chocolates, and everything else. 3% of global manufacturing is done by 3D printing machines. And by 1930, 30% of manufacturing will be 3D printing machines. And the 3D printing machines come. What happens to manufacturing? Now manufacturing is done in a particular way, it's part of the global supply chain. What the global supply chain? You have a large factory, the factory assembles parts, the parts are designed and made elsewhere and all the parts travel and come here and you assemble it and then take it and ship it. Tomorrow you'll have an industry like the auto industry where you may have a showroom or you may buy a car online. The moment a car is bought online and is delivered to you, it could come by itself. <laughs> you don't have to get delivery. Just send in a coordinates, it'll drive itself and come to your house and maybe honk you and say, I'm here, what do I do? <laughs> okay, so you make the car. Now, when the car comes to you, automatically the data is put in the computer and the computer takes the data, sends it to the parts, or whatever it is, sends to the machine and the machine start printing out the car. So you can sit down in your house and design a car if you want. Some designer in Bangalore will give you a designer car. You can do bespoke and do what you want and press a button, neighboring shop, the car will be printed. No assembly line, no distribution, large factories are gone, everything becomes decentralized. Gandhiji, you spoke about the village economy being self sufficient. This is a new age village economy. And everything will be decentralized and will be available to you. Is happening? Yes, it's happening. It's very small, but if it's an inflection point, it's going to have a tremendous change. So 3D printing is going to change the way manufacturing is done in a very in a very big way. And 3D printing will destroy supply chains, will destroy the use of oil, and destroy the use of war because you could 
recycle many things. Recycling because easier to break up metal parts into metal powder and use a powder or plastic or harder plastic and do those metal parts then distribute it and waste all sort of things. So manufacturing is getting disrupted in a very big way. Now look at uh, life sciences. Life sciences, medicine, people are living longer. They need more medical help. What is happening? The biggest change that's happening is DNA medicine. 30% of drugs don't see it, don't suit human beings because the chemical composition doesn't suit your DNA. You can't have a drug which can meet 100% uh, of people. So you can take your DNA and decode it and find out what is wrong and design the drug, make those chemical compounds and give you the right kind of a drug. So drugs can be bespoke. Is it happening? It's happening in labs. Then, if you have a damaged body part, you can get stem cells. Stem cells are unregulated cells, and these cells can take the part. When the baby is born, the baby has the mass of cells, and the cells take the shape of different kind of a body parts, right? If your body part is damaged, you pump this kind of a cells, and the cells can take the shape of the heart, the shape of the liver, the shape of everything else. So stem cell research has come to a stage where it's really making serious inroads. And tomorrow, you could have uh, uh, pumped stem cells to grow younger, and that will be a remarkable thing. And the next thing that's happening uh, in, in, in medicine is, uh, uh, you know, robotic surgery. How do you have surgery? You go take an x-ray, and the doctor feels you all over, finds out something is wrong, cuts you open, leaves everything else, sees what it is, cuts something, puts it back, leaves something here, and do whatever it does. Right? One doctor used something, some argon machine to write his initials on a liver. You heard about that in England, right? So you do that. Now, you take a 3D image of a person, a virtual image, and then a robot will come and make a small hole, go inside, take the body part, make something and come back and sew it up, and then you go home in the unit. Robotic surgery by Da Vinci, it becomes sophisticated. The role of the surgeon will be sit on the PC, sit on the screen and guide it and make sure you punch it and it works automatically. So 3D, uh, so robotic surgery is becoming a reality. It is there in Manipal Hospital. We do a lot of robotic surgery in Bangalore too and it's happening. The next will be aging. How do human beings age? At the age of 30, your body cells stop reproducing in the same manner they did up to 30. So up to 30, your body cells go on increasing every year or retain itself. So what happens? So eyesight is very good, everything is good. Past 30, the slow decline that happens and you start aging because the body cells don't regenerate at the same way it goes away. It doesn't, it doesn't replenish itself. So people are trying to find out what is the trigger in the DNA which makes the body stop regenerating and use big data analytics to make sure that can be the DNA can be triggered to make sure that the process of aging starts at the age of 50. So the time to do research, get big data, simulation models, blah, 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 and all that to make it happen. And it's happening, it could happen. And this is a very live example. Those of you who play cricket would know that when Dravid went to Australia for his last tour, he got bored between bat and ball four times. Came back to India and said, I'm retiring. When Sachin Tanduka played his last match, he cut the ball, it went to sleep for a catch. When Sehwag used to bat, he used to meet Shoy Bakhtar at 100 miles an hour and just swing it bat, it went to third man for a six. At the age of 30, he started swinging and never met the ball. <laughs> and Kapil Dev, after 34, came, used to bowl fast and hit him for a six. When a kid used to hit him for a six because the ball didn't travel. Why? Because the hand, eye, leg coordination came down a trifle. And you're facing a ball at 100 miles an hour is instinct that makes you play, not anything calculating. The body reacts by instinct. And the instinct is so fast. Body movements are so fast because there's no time to think. It's automated. The brain is a fantastic power. So the aging stops. Cancer. How does cancer work? Some parts, some cells in your body start regenerating and becoming bigger and they become malignant. Right? Why does it happen? Something gets triggered. They're trying to do research using big data and simulation to make sure they find this and how to make trigger of good cells to find the bad cells. If your body cells are metastasized and become into cancer, you make the good cells find the bad cells by sending a trigger and cure cancer. Is it going to happen? Test simulation has happened. In Bangalore, there's a company that does a very unique, unique uh, solution. The world has got six superbugs. There have been no new uh, antibiotics since 1962. The world has got six superbugs. And this company called Bugworks 
has simulated on a computer the six superbugs found out chemical compounds to break into the bacteria cells go to the nucleus and destroy the nucleus because the bacteria cells are well covered and no chemical compound could do that but they insulated it by doing big data analytics simulation and everything else and they got a six million uh, grant from carbex which is a global un fund because the global challenge to tackle that and they're doing human trials how did it happen it happened because of computing so in life sciences we're seeing a tremendous amount of change and the biggest change is coming because of brain research your brain has 100 billion neurons right and then you've got synapses each neuron each cell has got synapses it could be a trillion they connect with each other love affection hate everything is a chemical reaction in the brain and the brain works to weak electrical impulses so electrical currents that are generated and pass in your brain so memory is stored memory is recalled what i see all of you and the image is processed in my mind and it gives an image and the chemistry takes place and if some part of your brain is damaged i'll see a face but i'll not recognize is my wife or my child why because the brain doesn't recognize and put it in a memory and say this is a familiar face the base only recognizes to be a face but not something with the memory so if part of your brains are brains are damaged it doesn't work a famous neurologist explained this to us uh, sometime in chennai so they're trying to find out can you send weak electrical impulses to part of your brains and make the brain work in a particular way. They tried it in mice by sending electrical impulses and made sure that the muscles are made to twitch by sending electrical impulses. Very soon they could send electrical impulses, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 12 years, where they can make, they can, uh, make some part of your brain work independently. Now you've got something like a phantom limb. Phantom limb is what, if you lose your limb, it cut off. In your mind, you still feel the pain on your limb. Some people feel pain, they feel like scratching. The sensation come but you don't have a limb and this doctor has found out by having mirrors and doing some kind of uh, recognition that this can go away the phantom limb problem is a very peculiar problem and that's because the brain works in very particular way that part of the brain gets simulated so you can do brain research for doing this so you've got life sciences getting disrupted then education is getting disrupted in a very big way we went through three phases of education education 1.0 the gurukul of india or the academy of greece in the guru called children came there was a guru he taught them for 10 years and they went away they were children of the rich you know the story of ekalavya right ekalavya was not taught by a guru dronacharya but ekalavya was better than arjuna and ultimately he had to give his thumb to protect the prince and a sad story right but that was a form of education. Then came the industrial revolution where you had a lot of people. So industrial revolution, the factory mode of education, where there was a teacher who read all the books, the course curriculum, there are credits. You went to class, you sat down, you lectured, you wrote down the notes, you wrote it down in the examination, you got a piece of paper. Another degree and you got a job. Why? Because of the way of training. Mass, one to many. Now, all the knowledge of the teacher is available on the web. The lectures are available on the web. You can query and get an answer. You should know how to ask questions, and most of us know how to ask questions. And the child is suppressed, for the child starts asking. The child is curious, his mind is open, his conscious energy, why this, why that, why this? And we tell it this, this, this. Now a child can go and do it. So we're coming to a time when all the college courses are available. You can choose what you want. You can do a MOOCs course. You don't have to go to a university. You do a MOOCs course massively online, massively open online courses from various universities and get a designer degree. You can do a degree in music, with nuclear science, with biotechnology, with IT and dance, get those credits, put it together, go to a global university to give you a certificate. And the employer may want the certificate, recognize certificate, better than getting one from Patna University. <laughs> or whichever university it is. Because why? It certifies you from the best universities in the world. And is that coming? Well, the MOOCs is taking up in a big way. People are doing online courses. And I'm giving a lecture next week in the IM on the question, do students need universities? Think of this. Why do we need universities? We go to universities for many reasons. One, socialization. We go to socialize because we meet a peer group, we meet students, we talk to them, we learn to socialize, we learn to negotiate, etc. Socialization. We go there to learn because there's a teacher who comes and teaches us. Then we go there for assessment and examinations because you know we have to be certified and then we go there for the brand we go to a particular thing Stanford because we want the brand there are four major things now socialization is required because they're all growing up which we are social animals 
learning is not so required. You don't have to do four years. You can do one year. You can have tutoring and you can download all the courses. Do it on the web with lectures online and you can do it. Cut down the four years to two years. Assessment is not required by them because you can do online assessment. You can get somebody else to assess and give a certificate. And the certificate and the brand is not worth the money that you pay. For medicine today, you will pay 40 lakhs, 50 lakhs. For MD, you are going to pay this. Why? It's not worth it. The ROI is just not there. So people are asking why go to Harvard, why go to Stanford, why go to the universities? Because American students have one and a half trillion dollars of student loans. So education is getting disrupted. Then financial services getting disrupted. Why financial services? Because banking is the core of financial services very simply. You took money at 3% in the US, lent at 6%, you had a 3% spread, went home at 3 o'clock. Because you control the payment system. So now what happens? The way of investing, putting money into banks is changing because it's getting disrupted. You got robo finance by which robots will tell you where to invest and do whatever you want. And the way of lending and investing is getting disrupted because you got startups will give you money based upon credit rating and a thumbprint, and they do a credit rating for you. And the payment setting is get payment system is getting disrupted because many institutions are coming up to do payments online. They do payments by mobile, they're doing remittance by mobile. So entire financial services industry is getting disrupted, banks are shrinking, employment in banks are coming down, and banks are becoming totally online. Today, 75% of banking transaction is online in India. 75%. You don't require the big, big branches that you once had. You don't require so many people. In the last 15 years, banking assets and liabilities went up by 12 times in India. Employment went up by 5%. 5%. The stock market, you got 45% trading by algorithmic trading. You don't require brokers. 35% of all investment by ETFs. ETFs are electronic trading funds because they're all based upon algorithm and the algorithms are intelligent. So financial markets are getting disrupted. And today, the world has got eight, nine trillion dollars of money, government bonds at 0.5% interest. And then there's the right of disruptive finance. What is disruptive finance? The world is awash in liquidity. $14 trillion of currency has been printed by the Japanese Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, and China and other countries. Now the money is available in the money market at 0.5% interest. Ten-year bond rates in Germany is 0.3. It was a minus 0.5. You put money, you had actually government took money from you without paying you interest. Now, of course, slightly it's gone up. This rush is making money available. Venture capitalists are taking money, putting into startups, and putting into technology, and disrupting industry faster by pumping in money. So cycle of innovation, which was about three years, has come down to 18 months. The change is coming very, very rapidly around the world at the cutting edge of technology. In the midst of all this, information technology changing in a very rapid manner because the horizontal is a layer on which all this disruption is happening because technology and information technology is making all this happen. Let me give you an example. The best chess player has been beaten by IBM Watson. The best Go player has been beaten by a machine. Best Go player. And machines work 24 into 7. They don't ask for leave. They don't ask for salary raises. And chip designers come to where when cloud technology has created a huge amount of capacity. So you require computing power, of huge computing power to solve complex algorithms. They can be done cheaply because all available on the web at a very low price. People like AWS, people like Google and Amazon have got huge capacities of cloud computing. So you don't have to buy a server. Servers are gone. Data centers are gone. You just plug into it. You can start a business for $1,500, 90,000 rupees. Don't require a server form, don't require anything else because you get capacity, you can pay as you want, and most of it they give it away free. The cost of computing has come down tremendously. 1969, when Apollo 11, I think, went to the moon, there were only five kilobytes of memory. Can you believe that? The, your, your iPad or your iPhone has thousand times that memory. And things are becoming very complex. The whole world is getting networks to data centers. And what Geo is giving you unlimited capacity for 149 rupees. When Geo opened up, every Indian who came there free consumed 35 GB of memory, 35 GB of capacity. 35 GB is huge. So IT is transforming your thing, giving intelligence to machines. And then robots are coming. In a lab in the United States by Boston Dynamics, they made a robot do a backflip. Go see the video. The robot is standing here. It does a black flip and lands on his feet. So mobility. 
Now, when we walk, we are balanced on two legs. There's mobility, there's balance in the ears, your brain takes everything else and you can walk. Robots can't do that, it's very complex. But this robot is able to do a backflip and now they got a robot which can run as fast as a cheetah. 60 kilometers an hour. This is all designer there. In China, a friend of mine went and went to a factory. There's one kilometer in depth, half a kilometer wide, it is dark. You went and asked, where are the people? There are no people, it's fully robotics. Everything is being manufactured by the robot and the goods come out the other side, it's gone into a vehicle, the vehicle still has a driver. The driver also will go. <laughs> and if there's a problem, there'll be a light, you can go to a PC and fix it and go there and set things right. You go to your auto factory, they're only robots. Adidas bought back entire two factory from China to Germany, fully robotics. Fully with robots. And Foxconn, the largest contract manufacturer electronics in the world with just iPhone, replaced 50,000 young girls with robots last year because those people, 1.1 million people, went and asked for a raise. They wanted more money. They had audacity to ask for an increment. They said, out 50,000. They're going to replace 500,000 girls with robots. We have robots that develop dexterity in the fingers. When you do assembly, you need dexterity. Now, the dexterity is a question of algorithms and how to move things and everything else. It's all being done. We went to the Tesla factory in the United States. We saw the giant robots at work. Unbelievable. The robots are lifting, stamping, doing everything. Entire thing is robots. The robots are coming in manufacturing in a very big way. China makes more robots than any country in the world. Small scale industries in India are taking robots. In Japan, robots are the largest selling domestic utensils. Where Japan has got 30% of people above 65. If you're lonely, the robot will make your bed, make tea for you, poo for you, it'll hug you, it'll be warm, it'll not talk back. <laughs> it'll not talk back, it'll talk when you want. Sing when you want, do what you want, right? It's amazing what is happening. They're getting robots to look like humanoids. So what you saw in Star Wars, with all of them could work. Imagine a war where the tanks go, they're controlled remotely, Drones are going control from Nevada to Waziristan and killing all the jihadists now. Tanks will grow because they're getting information from GPRS and everything else. And they're seeing the shells will go automatically. You send these robots to fight for you with these guns. It'll be like a video game. Like a video game, right? So you're seeing IT being everything else. What is the cumulative impact of all this? Every facet of our life is getting disrupted. What are the cumulative impact? By 2030, you're going to see a new world. A world where oil consumption is coming down. A world where energy will no longer be by coal and be largely solar and wind. A world where there'll be mostly electric cars. There'll be mostly autonomous cars. A world where factories will be run by robots. And a world where, you know, education will be totally changed. A world where people can live up to 120. Today, children born in America live up to 100. So all the billionaires will live longer. The rest of us who are poor, who can't afford to pay, are going to die early. And a world where banking will be fully automated with robo-finance. And you just push in what you want, you may get what you want. And if you don't pay, God help you, you'll be shut out of the system. And a world where all the things happen, and people are raising the question, what will human beings do? Biggest problem is coming, we've got 7 billion people, what are they doing? One, the world is aging. Japan last year produced only 9,50,000 babies and 1.3 million Japanese died. By 2030, 2050, the Japanese population of 126 million will come down to 97 million and come down to 67 million by 2100. The Japanese oppress their women, ill-treat their women. Because after the war, the men went to work came back home and drunk at 11 o'clock. They had one or two children, the women had to take care, and the men of retirement came back home, wanting to be served. In the meantime, the wife has created her own networks. So they've gone distant from the husband. Husband comes down, wants to have Lord, be like a Lord, wants to be served. And this woman is asking, who is the stranger? And there are divorces happening because of that. And young girls were treated like tree girls. They want good job, they don't want to marry. 35% of young people below the age of 35 never have interaction with the opposite gender. Imagine if boys and girls don't meet and produce babies, what happens? Society dies. Society ages. It's happening in Japan in a very big way. They're not making babies. Girls are working, taking the money, having all this, and then we don't want men. They're a pain. They don't even want to talk to men. 
I'm not joking, just read the literature. So they're aging. Russia's, life, Russia's men lifespan has come down and Russia is shrinking in population. Scandinavia is shrinking in population. Germany is shrinking in population. There are three young people to pay the pension of one senior. By 2020, there'll be two because they pay a pension like that. 25% of UK is Asian. Sorry, sadly for them, largely Pakistan in Bangladesh, they're going to have deep trouble. So in France, 15% of the population North African. If they're not there, the French will soon disappear. And in 125 years, 125,000 years, the male gene will go extinct. So there are changes taking place in population. But till then, what do we do? So many people are saying, we must tag this robots for social security and pay people basic income. Basic income, they had a referendum in Switzerland two years ago, where they said, we're going to pay every Swiss 2,250 euros per month, young person 975 euros, and was defeated with only 23% of people voting because the majority said the Syrians will come and take it away and the Tamils will come and take it away. But people are thinking of having basic income where everybody gets a paycheck every month and robots will be taxed. Bill Gates spoke about it, Elon Musk from Tesla spoke about it and that's the debate by economists. In our country too, our CEO, chief economic advisor spoke about it, Jaitley said it's too premature and this is a big debate. What are human beings going to do? How many jobs are there? India has been producing 25 million babies every year for the last 30 years. Look at population, take the death rate, you'll find it out. And our 25 million, maybe 17 million, 16 million require jobs because 30% will get married or go into agriculture. We are producing only 5 to 6 million jobs. The last 10 years, 1 crore youngsters in the age group of 21 to 30 have not got jobs. For the next 1 year, next 10 years, another one crore a year will not get jobs. By 2025, there'll be 20 crore people in India in the age group of 21 to 45 with no jobs or bad jobs. Bad jobs means less than 10,000 rupees a month. It's a forgotten generation. There is no demographic dividend. There's a disaster. That's why you are the Patidas, you are the Gujars, the Jar, the Marathas fighting, you are the Tamils fighting, you have all kind of people fighting. Go, of course, you still have your fish and this and that, and you'll have robots to fish for you and give you will be happy. <laughs> Don't have this problem for some more time. So India has got also deep problems. So there's a problem around the world. What is the solution? We have to come with new models. We have to look and see what is happening. But this disruption is all pervasive. And traditional businesses are getting disrupted in significant way. We are 10 years behind America in facing this disruption because we're still growing. We need to spend 6.9% of GDP on infrastructure. We're spending 4.5. We still have to spend a lot of money on this on on our infrastructure. We are a country with unsatisfied demand and lack of supply. If supply comes at lower prices, we grow, like the uh, airline industry, which has grown at double digits for the last 36 months. So we are in a country where demand is huge at low prices. So we are not going to be impacted for the 10 years, but the job intensity of growth in GDP will come down. If earlier the GDP grew at 10% or 9%, jobs grew at 5 to 6%. Now the GDP grows at 10%, jobs will grow at 3%. In America, GDP grows at 2.5%, jobs are growing at 1%. GDP grows at 2%, it will be zero, and jobs will decline. America's payroll was 165 million 10 years ago, now it's come to 150 million. And this is impacting politics. For the last 15 years, political leaders in the world were left up, left up center. They create a narrative in the Western world that immigration is good for them, that globalization is good for them, that open trade is good for them. It is good for the Chinese who became very rich, it's good for the Asians who became very rich. The middle class income in, in America didn't increase for the last 15 years. And then all these people who told them these stories became rich. They went on speaking tours, they built bank balances, they all go down and the rich billionaires gave them money to listen to them. And suddenly when they came to election last time, you had uh, Hillary going and telling everybody, people, American, they're all deplorables. They don't understand. We know everything. We'll tell you what to do. Don't tell us. And they threw her out. She lost. Trump came to power. And what did Trump say? I'll make America great. I'll shut down immigration. I'll shut down trade. I'll make America great. I'll go bash up the bad guys. And the simple Americans went and voted for him. The people in the mountains who dig coal voted for him. Coal is gone. But they voted for him. Brexit happened. Europe is going right. India went right of center, from left of center. We destroyed us for 10 years. Abe has come to power. So politics around the world has changed because of this disruption, because of lack of income growth in, uh, in the OECD, because of lack of inflation in the OECD, lack of adequate jobs in the OECD. Now that is going around the world. 
And that's the society we're going to face. So we've got to create new models, we've got to understand how to manage, and we've got to create social structures in India to take care of all of this. So industries are getting disrupted in a much bigger way than think. Thank you very much. Truly, change is happening in big leaps and bounds. We now move on to the interactive interaction session. Uh, Questions? Yeah. Okay. I request the audience to ask questions pertaining to the issue. Sir, regarding the Second World War, we did the starting of the Second World War, the failure of the British policy, British political policy, diplomacy. Or no, I think it happened because the British signed the Treaty of Versailles, which was very unfair in 1921. It has got a deep history of its own. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Akshay Sangorkar. My question is, uh, do you see a reverse in global warming because of destruction in the petroleum industry? You see, it all depends whether we're going to reduce the carbon and the carbon in the atmosphere will be absorbed uh, by plants or whatever it is. So it, right now, I think the odds are the temperature will rise one to two degrees. The odds are there, but it depends on how fast the change is going to come. India, China are reducing the energy intensity. U US is also reducing, though Trump is not agreeing. <coughs> the Europeans are reducing. So I think it's a little bit of balance now compared to five, ten years ago. Things may be better than what people predict. It could stabilize at a new level, but there's going to be some warming. And uh, the worst scenario will be 100 feet of water rising all round. If you stay on the beach, be careful. <laughs> I stay at 1,000 meters in Bangalore. <laughs> Hello, my name is Priyanka Deshpande. Yeah. And I would like to know the uh, future of cryptocurrency. Well, cryptocurrency has come as an alternative to currency by some techies for a simple reason. People say that sovereign governments print more and more currency, the depressed currency. They will come with a new kind of currency. It can be used for payment. Worthy 20 million are going to be printed. That's a Bitcoin. And it moves on a technology called blockchain. So blockchain is a piece of code, which is read only, which is between two parties with no central ledger, or the ledger is kept with the people uh, who own it, and then you can transfer to somebody else. So it has come as a means of payment, it's in the virtual world, and there's speculation because uh, there's going to be only 20 million and it'll happen. But are they going to become the currency of the world? I don't think so. For simple reason, governments are not going to give it up. Right? They're going to ban, they have the force of law, they're all sovereign, so it's very difficult. Is it going to be an alternate investment class for assets? Quite possibly. Because everybody wants to invest and make money because it's very speculative and it's all limited uh, by mining. So various people are doing cryptocurrency everything. So we're seeing a boom. Well, 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 we're going to see what happens. And if you've got cryptocurrency, you made money, well, better to take your profits out and stay put. But I think it's an interesting phenomena as a reaction to governments printing too much of money, but hopefully something new will come out of it. But blockchain is a great technology. Blockchain will destroy uh, the people who hold your ledger like banks, like depositories and everybody else because all the, today all the information is held by somebody else. Tomorrow you can uh, you know, control the information that you have. All your information will belong to you and you can give it to anybody you want provided they pay money to you or if you agree to give it to them. Uh, sir, my name is Vishwanath Swar. Uh, is a, a global university or global degree, a reality. Well, well, second question, sir. I'll answer the question first. I think it's happening in a way because MOOCs is becoming a reality. Today, if you want to be a software engineer, you go to a coding school and do a coding contest, and if you solve the problem, they're giving you jobs. They're not looking which university you come from because that's a grading criteria. So I think it's slowly happened. And once it's happened by 10%, then the world is going to change. Because people are asking, what is the value of this degree? Everybody's got a degree. In America, 70% of people got a degree. In Europe, 80% of people got a degree. So does it show you your skills? No. Many things are outdated and things are not changing because the faculties and everybody rest is changed. So it's happening in a way, but MOOCs is growing. Online courses are growing and that's the thin edge of the wedge. So what is the rate of the changing yeah. MSL, MSL? Huh? MSL means CPA. I don't know, it's gone up by two, three centimeters in the last two, three years. 
because icebergs are in, in Arctic, I think they're all melting. We've seen a big breaking of the Arctic uh, on the big uh, ice shelves are broken. We don't know, we have to see, wait and see. Yeah, you want another question? Yeah. Sir? Yeah. Uh, India is spending so much money on uh, petrol, uh, wasting so much money. Uh, why can't we go ahead full swing with that alternative of electric car by using the solar energy? We what are the hitches? We don't have lithium ion, we don't have a battery plant, we don't have the technology, we only have talk. So they got a policy, hopefully it will stop. Even the Maruti wants to make batteries here, Nizan wants to make batteries here, and the buses may come. So it will happen because market forces will force that. So we got to reduce, make it, uh, make uh, import duty zero for electric vehicles. The Nizan will make it a $10,000 car. Then I think that will be it. And when Maruti shifts, that will be the big one because Maruti is 50% of India's production. I think it's beginning to happen. We got to see in the next two years, there going to be dramatic changes because costs are going to come down, battery costs are coming down 15, 20% a year. <coughs> what, what is the scenario of this atomic energy in this new conventional energy? Atomic energy will re remain because France gets 70% <coughs> of energy from atomic energy. It will remain for some more time. Till next time somebody blows up and we'll see what happens. But I think atomic energy will slowly die. Sir, because alternate energy will come up. Because alternate energy can up, the problem will be peak load and night load. Night load, the windmills can still run at night. Then it comes to storage. So energy efficiency has come, come in. Today, if you shift to the latest technology, you can save 30% of energy. In Infosys, we brought down per capita consumption of energy in seven years from 294 units per person month to 165 per person month. The staff doubled from 1 lakh to 2 lakh, but energy consumption went up only 15%. Remarkable change. So everybody can reduce energy consumption. 18,000 megawatts of power consumption is supposed to come down in India because of Pius coil and the LED lighting. To be 20% of world's energy is not required if you're energy efficient. If you've got an AC more than seven years, shift it because, change it because you save you 30, 40% energy. Sir, thank you for your mesmerizing lecture. I, I appreciate your in-depth knowledge on a lot of fronts. As you have just proposed for the automation that will get in less <coughs> First of all, I don't propose anything. I'm only telling you what is happening. <laughs> so, you know, it's not my proposition. So, all I say, there is anarchy in India. It will only accelerate. We've got to learn how to live with it. What is the solution? I don't know. Because just imagine the magnitude of the changes in a short period of time. See the magnitude of the change. Go back 10 years and see where you were, what was there. And see now what is there. The change is so tremendous because you're part of the change, you don't feel it. But you see a child today, child of four and five, see how they operate. And see yourself, you see the tremendous change. So what's going to happen? I don't know. Hello. Uh, you have got a lot of about uh, uh, automobile industry, but uh, uh, what is going to happen in the real estate building industry? Because it has got a good proportion in economy, total economy. Yeah, even in real estate, there is surplus buildings all around uh, India. Now in the hotel industry, there's Airbnb, which is uh, trying to lease out surplus houses, but the demand may come down. But more and more people are going to travel, more and more things will happen. So let us see, if supply increases, the prices will stabilize, scarcity will go away. For example, in Bangalore, we have 42 kilometers of metro. By 2022, we'll have 250 kilometers of metro. So if metro comes, one kilometer next to a metro, they're going to allow high rises. So there'll be concentration of city. All around the world, the suburbs are dying and people are coming into the heart of the city. In, Los, in, in LA, the suburbs are shrinking, the people are coming in center, it's happening in San Francisco, it's happening in, uh, in New York, it's happening in European countries. So people are coming because it's public transportation and young people don't want to own places, they don't want to own cars, they want to lease them out. The new model of sharing 
is coming in, which will have its own repercussions. But you know, the industry depends on where you are. If you are in India, it will still grow because we have a shortage. India will still grow for 10, 15 years. Don't have to worry. In, okay, let me tell you this. Okay, India's fertility today is 2.2, 2.1 is replacement. The whole of South India is 1.8. You take the population of Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, 1971, 2011, we have come down from 30% of India to 25% of India. Kerala's population has grown only five, only five percent in the last, uh, in the last uh, 10 years. India has grown 15, 17%. Kerala has grown only 5%. And today in Kerala, 9% of Kerala, 9% of people in Kerala speak Hindi. They are from Bihar. And uh, 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 Nagaland's population has shrunk by 0.5% <coughs> in the last 10 years. 10 years, 2001-2011. So the South is aging, will grow older, population will shrink after 10 years because they are not producing enough babies. The fertility rate in Bihar is 3.2, UP is 2.6. Uh, uh, Rajasthan is 2.4, India will be 2.1 by 2020. So our population is stabilizing very, very rapidly. That's why in the south you have more schools than children. In Kerala, in Bangalore, in all of the south in Tamil Nadu. And uh, if you look at children in the age group of 18 to 23, the data is there with the MHRD in that higher education report, you'll find that in Tamil Nadu the last five years, the age group of 18-23 has shrunk by 15% for 5 years. Karnataka too is shrunk. Goa has gone up slightly. I think you've got too much of immigration. <laughs> People are coming from outside. So I think it's happening here. But uh, 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 Nagaland has shrunk. Uh, Tamil Nadu has shrunk. Kerala has shrunk. Uh, so the whole of the south is shrinking. You won't have problems. The, the north is going to rule over you. <laughs> Yogi is going to become ruling over all of you. He's going to come here. Okay. Uh, you spoke about the supply chain. In the future, do you see mega corporation owning mega factories and supply to all? The supply chain is going to get destroyed because of 3D printing. Because 3D printing is localized manufacturing. So, so is it good for the small man or good for the big man? It's good for the small man. Because you get more power. Because the shipping is going to come down, pipelines are going to come down, because oil consumption is going to come down, shipping from place to place is going to come down, because production is going to become more localized. Thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Pai. Thank you so much for the insights. Uh, so we spoke, uh, or you spoke a lot about disruption in traditional businesses. But from your point of view, are there any businesses which are not unaffected, but least affected, or you know, very less affected by all these changes? Look, if you are in the innovation business, if you are in the business to disrupt others, you'll disrupt others, you'll do well. <laughs> <laughs> because just imagine you've got a very large company, big and fat, making a lot of money. You come with a new model, you disrupt them, right? Like e-commerce, right? E-commerce is still working. Flipkart raised six and a half billion, they lost four billion. They've got another two and a half billion to lose. They don't have a model, but you know, the value is high. See, agriculture is undergoing a very, very big change. Netherlands has become the largest exporter of fruits and vegetables. You're getting hydrophonics and aquaphonics. In New York, you've got factories and warehouses where you go plant with artificial lighting with no soil. So you can grow plants with no soil, with artificial lighting, and you can mass produce it. And uh, because you mass produce it in the urban areas, you don't have to transport. You can cut the crop when you want it. So fruits and vegetables are going to be done that way in a very significant way. <coughs> so that is changing too, in a very dramatic way. And human beings are eating less because you don't require so much of food for because you don't do physical labor. Our 2,500 calories a day requirement is based upon certain amount of physical labor. So look at this word. The rich are becoming thinner. The poor are becoming bigger in America. They're eating junk food. 100 years back, Everybody used to greet and say, have you eaten enough? Right? John Kella. Now, no. Because they're all shrinking. They're all eating less. Because they don't require that kind of energy. Right? So consumption may come down. How much will come down, we have to see. Otherwise, in India, you see, we have cereals. 
Cereals are in stock because people have shifted from cereals to proteins. And from proteins, very soon they will shift to maybe eating less. Because today in India, we have 170 million tons of milk being produced every year. The largest producer, 320 million tons of fruits and vegetables, doubled in the last 10 years. So if we have food habits and everything is undergoing a change. So we'll see what has to happen. You see, you need to model this. I'm just thinking and telling you some data. Somebody has to model it, somebody has to find out, do the data analytics and do some research to get some answers and find out mega trends. Any other questions? So I have women to ask questions. Yes, ma'am. How about relationships and emotions among the people? Huh? How about the relationships in between two individuals or the Yes, I think see. I think, I think that is going to be a casualty because first of all, you have small families, you have very pampered children, and you have sheltered children. Children don't go and play, they don't socialize, they sit on their machines, and sit on their phones, and mumble to each other. Even me, I send messages to my wife. Email, we communicate by email or WhatsApp. I mean, I'm shocked at myself. I'm sure all of you do. Come for a movie, no, I'm coming home for dinner. Why are you not coming for dinner? I mean, I'm going away. If you feel the phone, you get a firing, so. <laughs> you make an automated machine when you're traveling. How are you, sweetheart? I'm missing you very much. Then she'll make a bot and say, well, I'm not missing anymore. <laughs> see, relationship is changing. I mean, you see it in your children too, right? People are becoming more individualistic, more self-centered, right? That uh, gossip is becoming less. We don't talk about others so much. Very shocking, man, you know? It's a very large form of socialization, chatting. I don't know what is the concrete word for that. What is the word? Ah, Panchadike. Panchadike is coming down. I mean, it's tragic. It's a social culture. We're losing it out. We don't have anybody. So social behavior is changing. And people are becoming more self-centered, more one-sided. So I don't know. Even compassion is coming down. Sensitivity is coming down. I mean, look. I'm saying that, but nobody has made a study. I think I have not seen studies. Every generation, I guess, says that. But. Sir, her last question. Uh, no, she is asking the last question. <laughs> <laughs> we are seeing in Goa, there is a lot of pressures on services because unemployed person joining to Goa, Bihar, UP, so many things. Likewise, problem on Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta, Chennai, everywhere it is. What government of India, particularly state, should chalk out the policies to get them uh, locally job and this problem should be avoided and totally agree. Then uh, what are the policies government of India should think for for future or you think government of India is thinking about you a mistake. <laughs> Look, government doesn't have the foggiest idea what to do. Let me tell you, I work with government, they don't have the foggiest idea. They don't even know how many jobs are being produced in this country. We prepared a jobs report. I met the uh, Prime Minister, Principal Secretary, present to him. We're going to put it out in the media in the next two or three days. They don't even have data. Delhi is far away. I think you are best talking to your CM and telling him what to do and have a group and see how to take care of Goa. Forget India. See, our problem is India is a collection of 29 countries. Nobody understands India. You can't run India. It's too diffuse, too large. Nobody has run a large country like this except China. And China is homogeneous, not heterogeneous like us, not diverse like us. So we should all concentrate on our own state, on our own city, and take care of ourselves, and let them take care of themselves. Even the judges are fighting. But they can do it. <laughs> no, honestly, I come to the conclusion there's no point, because you know each state is different, everything is different. We'll take care of ourselves. No, take care of Goa, make sure everybody has a good quality of life, everybody has like, access to health, you've got you know comfortable living, fresh air, fresh water. Yeah, you're facing problem because nobody wants to do infrastructure, nobody wants to do the hard work, nobody wants to wash dishes. Everybody wants somebody to do the work, right? Yes. Look, I don't have an answer. Believe in a free. How many Goans have gone outside Goa? 40 50 percent of Goans are outside? 50 percent of the children are outside? If all of them said we don't want Goans to come here, you go away, what will happen to you? Sir, what will happen to nationalism? Which nationalism? Of our country. The concept of nationalism. It remains straight. Nationalism is still there. I am patriotic, nationalistic. You are patriotic, you are nationalistic. Yes. 
What will happen? Nothing will happen. <laughs> no, why are we worried about all nationalism? What will happen? We are all nationalistic, we are all patriotic, but because we live in peace, all that doesn't matter. If we are attacked, we will all fight for our country, correct? Correct. Yeah, why worry? <laughs> Sir, my question is about sir, your, oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, you gave the idea of Akshay Patra. If today uh, you were to suggest one more winning idea, what would it be? Well, the idea I would tell is, I want a national scholarship program so that every child will get money for education to go to a school, college of their choice. Oh. Let me tell you, data has come out. An illiterate woman with no schooling except fourth class produces five to six babies. A semi literate woman, 10th standard, 11th standard, 3 to 4. A graduate, 2. A postgraduate, 1 or 0. <laughs> because education is the biggest transformation for any society. We must educate our women. You educate your women, society is remade. Look at Goa, women are educated. Look at South Kendra district, women are very educated. South Kendra has the best human development indices for India. Highly educated. You have a problem in a different manner, but you know you can leave it. Sir, <laughs> so my question because is about Kendra has got more number of engineers and more number of ICS officers. They had ICS and IS. Nobody goes to IS now. <laughs> Only Bihar is come. You know Bihar, UP, Uttar Pradesh. Bihar, those are settled in Delhi. They only come. Yeah, they go to Delhi and become IS. Yes. Go and should join the IS, work in government in Delhi. Sir, so my question is about uh, your philanthropy. Um, what inspires you uh, to give so much of your time and your uh, income to the society? Well, my philosophy is very clear. Society has been good to me. My parents have given me good education. I succeeded very well. I have to give it back to my society. I want to see a better country. I'm very proud of my country. You know, I want to see an India where every Indian has got food on the table, power in the safe switch water in the house, a sewage in the a toilet in the house, a roof over the head, a road to the house, education for the children, access to health and job opportunities. Every single Indian. Because birth is an accident. We don't ask to be born in a family. We are born in a good family. My parents were very poor. My mother didn't have food when she was growing up in Sonti You know, that's 60, 70 years ago, 70 years ago. India was a poor country. My father was an orphan. He lost his father. His father used to work in a British firm. He lost his, he was, a, he was an orphan. They used to live on five rupees a month for the family. An illiterate mother, four children. He was put in an Ananta Ashram. Kendra High School educated him, gave him a job. He went to Bombay, lived as a, ran away to Bombay, lived as a Budli, served on the table of, you know, like a Kama Total founder. They were all together in Fort. Then he got a job in Bangalore, became a branch manager. He sent me to school in a car. And we were well off. But he suffered. Both of them did very well. Both of them are standard 10. They couldn't study more. And they gave me a good education. I've done well. My children are very doing very well. One boy went to Stanford, he's come back. Others the Berlin Chartered Colony, they're living well. So I got to give it back. And that's just personal. It's just personal to me. You know, I don't want to make a judgment on anybody else. I think all of us should give back because we have to make the world better if you want to be happy. You can't be a rich person in a sea of poverty. They're going to get you. They're going to get you. You can't escape. Thank you very much.